It's very difficult to properly organize your immediate environment. And that's another thing I try to do with the books is show that some of these so-called simple things, clean your room, it's like, I'll tell you, this, this is the truth. I've been trying to organize my office for three years. And we, I was flooded by so much mail and so much catastrophe that I fell way behind in my ability to keep my closet organized, my clothes organized. Uh, I had three years worth of mail sitting in my office at the university, thousands of pieces of mail. And um, it took a lot of work to, and it's still not done. I hope I'll, I hope I'll have my damn room clean by the time I go out on tour and for symbolic purposes, among other reasons, to have my house in order and my and beautified again as well. But uh, I like to show that simple things aren't so simple, especially if you try them. You know, I had clients, one client, his mother had died and it was a large family and the family kind of fell into disorder after she died because it was all boys, it was all sons and, and a father. And no one had really picked up the maternal role, you know, the stereotypical maternal, the necessary stereotypical maternal role. And he decided he was going to try to do that. And man, you know, his brothers and his father, they weren't happy when he first went to get groceries. You know, they felt that he was kind of trying to take the place of the mother. So there was all that grief that was still there. And then the, who the hell did he think he was? And et cetera, et cetera. I mean, people's houses aren't in order because that's really hard. It's really hard. And so... And it causes a lot of chaos and strife to try to do it. And so usually it isn't done. And it isn't until you actually try it, like right down to the detail that you start to understand how difficult it is. And then also how to appreciate. You also start to appreciate how necessary it is. So it's fun, sh it's fun shedding light on that sort of thing. And the, the non-triviality of the ordinary. And part of the reason I concentrate on the individual is because I don't think the things we do are trivial. If you think the things you do are trivial, then you're either bringing a trivial attitude towards them or you're doing things that you're not doing the things you should be doing. Or you're not framing the situation appropriately. So, and you know, you might dispute that, but and that's okay, you could, but you know, one thing that I, my depressive clients, for example, would say, I can't really figure out why anything is worth doing if we're all going to die in the end. It's like, you know, it's fair enough. But I said, I think it was last night in my lecture, I said, if a baby's crying in front of you and you know it's cold or hungry, you don't cease to attend to its distress because the sun is going to envelop the earth in four billion years. You think, that's not a good excuse. Well, why not? Why not use that time frame? And your instinctive answer is, well, that's just not the appropriate time frame. And so I would say, well, if you have the habit, habit the habitual inclination, to apply to your own life a time frame or an evaluative frame, framework that reduces what you're doing to meaninglessness, then you should consider whether or not you're using the wrong time frame. Right? If it all of a sudden becomes meaningless, pointless, you're suffering in the work you have to do, well, find a time frame that is appropriate, you know, sufficient unto the day, let's say. That's a good start. I was talking to one of the leaders of the Conservatives this morning, and they're they're asking me about the person was asking me about Bill C-16, but more specifically about talking to young people, because the Conservative leadership struggle is going on right now. I've been talking to a bunch of them, and I said, "Well, look, one of the things you could do for young people that no one's doing is to talk to them about responsibility, because you know, everyone talks to young people about rights. It's like we need our rights. It's like, oh God." How many rights do you need? You know, really, like you have more privileges than any people who've ever lived anywhere. Well, it's so dull to hear, it's so dull, it's so pathetic and, and uh, what would you call it? It's so demeaning that you have to be protected and have your rights. It's like I said, there's a huge marketplace for responsibility. That's what you want to talk to young people about. It's like, get your act together and do something worthwhile with your life. For the first time in my entire adult life, the conservatives actually have something to sell young people, right? They can sell them responsibility. It's like, well, why? Because that's where me life has meaning with responsibility. The more responsibility you take on, the more meaning your life has. And the, the higher degree of responsibility that you 
agree voluntarily to try to bear, the richer your life will be. And no one's ever told that, and it's the case. You know, it's like you have, you have four kids, say. Well, that's plenty of responsibility. You're going to have meaning. It's going to be rough, you know, because it's complicated. You have a complicated job, and you try to help the careers of the people around you. You try to solve tough problems and aid suffering and do all of that. It's like, it's weight. It's responsibility, but it's, there's glory in it. There's real glory in it. There's deep meaning in it. And, and, and young people are starving for that because no one ever tells them that. It's like, you're way more than you think. Man, stand up. Do something difficult. Do something difficult and heroic, right? Burst out of your bonds. It's like, that's a good message. It's a necessary message because we have to be more than we are because if we... If we aren't, we're not going to survive. Generally, if I engage in conflict, the reason I engage in it is because I think the alternative is worse. And so, you know, if you're trying to settle things with a family member, there's often a terrible minefield that you have to wander through to reach anything approximating a lasting peace. And avoiding it doesn't make it better. And it's terrible to confront it. And it, it can be virtually um, or beyond your capacity to tolerate to do it and so people avoid it very frequently but that doesn't make peace it just harbors underground resentment and breeds bitterness and, and, and hatred and so that's not unless that's what you want that's not a good solution why do you think it is that some of the things that you've said and the way you've gone about kind of writing up your stuff has been such a phenomenon and caused so many people to sit up and pay attention to it well, I suppose in some sense those things that we take for granted we regard as obvious, but if we take them for granted and we regard them as obvious, and then they're challenged, we often have no idea why they're valuable. You know, so for example, I've had many clients who were considering getting married or were not getting married, and they would say to me, well, it's just a piece of paper. And they thought that was a pretty good argument. That's not a good argument at all. That's an argument that's so shallow that you hardly know where to begin. But, you know, if someone comes up to you on the street and say, says, defend marriage, it's like, well, what, what do you know? It's like, how are you going to do that? It's what's so obvious that it's defensible that you don't have the arguments at hand. I mean, you know, you're not a legal philosopher. And so people who do that, they think they're intelligent because they can put you on the spot. But and merely the, the mere fact that you can't articulate your a claim you share with almost everyone in some traditional sense doesn't mean either that you're stupid or that the that the principle itself is invalid. It just means that we tend not to discuss all those things we agree upon. It doesn't mean they're without merit. So, so the rules. I mean, I've been criticized. My books have been criticized. Well, they're you know self-help, and I think well. I'm actually not contemptuous of that, so that criticism doesn't bother me. I, my clinical practice, uh, many of my clients were brought to whatever philosophical understanding they had through so-called self-help books. And if they were reading books, you know, that's not so bad. And what were they trying to do, improve themselves? I mean, how pathetic is that? And then to pander to an audience that needs self-improvement. You know, it's like, well, so yes, the rules were obvious, but the reasons for them weren't. And so I think the reason the books were popular, or one of the reasons, is that I tried to make a case for why these hypothetically simple axiomatic propositional statements were neither simple nor obvious and why they were also necessary. And people like to be walked through the whole process of, of the thought that, that underlies the claim, let's say. Thank you, Lord, for coming. Much appreciated. Being unbelievably warmly welcomed here, which is pretty good for a magical super Nazi. So. <laughs> <laughs>